Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. And this is the very last chapter of the book of Joshua, and this is what it says. Then Joshua said to the people, Now respect the Lord and serve him fully and sincerely. Throw away the gods that your ancestors worshipped on the other side of the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. But if you don't want to serve the Lord, you must choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. You may serve the gods of, that your ancestors worshipped when they lived on the other side of the Euphrates River, or you may serve the gods of the Amorites who lived in this land. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Pray with me. Lord, Joshua dedicates his life to serve you. May these words be words that, that linger with us a long time. Words that we become a part of our lives. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I don't remember the first time that I began to notice the dedication in the front cover of, of books. I, I think for the longest time, I, they seemed to always say, and to my wife and perfect children. And so I, I kind of overlooked them. I think one of the very first times, I remember when I started reading them, it was Lyle's a, Lyle Schaller book, he had his dedication in the front of the book and it said to Shang. He said, Shang, who, who gets plenty of rest, who has clear sense of his own identity and has the ability to ignore trifling diversions. It's not, it wasn't until later on in the book that you realize Shang is his dog and he's dedicated the book to his dog. One of my favorite book dedications is, was by Tobias Wolfe. He said, to my stepfather who used to say, what I don't know would fill a book. Well, here it is. <laughs> so often nowadays, it's in the front of the book that people have their dedication. Well, here's Joshua's book. And his dedication is in the very last, last few verses of the book. He's dedicated his book to what he's dedicated his life to. He's dedicated his life to God. One of the strongest, most courageous, most upstanding characters in, in the whole of the Bible. Joshua was a teenager when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And so Joshua was, was, was a very, very young, young person when, when Moses led God's people into the wilderness Led them for about two weeks until they came to the River Jordan. And, and Moses and God's people looked over into the promised land and he said, that's the land that God has promised you. And so each of the 12 tribes chose one person to go into that land for, for 40 days and scout out what the land was like, what the fruit was like, what the people were like. Joshua represented his tribe. He was one of the 12 that went into the, the promised land to see what the land was like. And they came back after 40 days and, and they poured out these grapes and said, this is what's in that land that God has promised to. Well, the people had never seen grapes that were that big and that plentiful. They poured out figs. 
So these are what the figs are like in that land that God has promised us. They had never seen figs so big. Pomegranates. They were huge pomegranates. And they said, these, this is what's in that land that God's promised us. And, and then they said, and there's one more thing. Giants. The people are giants. They're huge. They thought we were grasshoppers when we were over there. That's how big. The, there's no way in the world that, that we can take the land that, that, that God has given us. And 10 of the 12 tribes joined together and said, let's just go ahead and kill Moses. It's only been two weeks and 40 days. We can go back to Egypt. Maybe Pharaoh will let us be his, slave, their, his slaves again. It was all except for Joshua and Caleb. They said, if God says that's the promised land, that's the land that we've been promised. We can go now. The other 10 tribes said, no way, no how. We'll just kill Moses and head on back to Egypt. And that's when God's anger burned. And God wanted to just smote them all. And that's when Moses stepped in. He stepped in on behalf of those who wanted to kill him. And the Bible tells us that God changed his mind. Not many times do you see those words in the Bible, but they're there. They're there. God changed his mind. What it lets us know is the future is not set. That God's preferred future is one that, that we make together, and that's why we pray, because the future is not set. That's why we long to know the heart of God, because the, the future is not set. God did have punishment for them, though. He said, for every day that the scouts spent in the promised land, you'll spend one year in the wilderness. And so for 40 years, they journeyed through the wilderness. They followed God as a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And it was in those 40 years that the people went from being no people to being God's people. 40 years later, they stood on the banks of the, the Jordan River looking over into the promised land, the one that had been promised to them 40 years before, and everyone was gone except for Moses, except for Caleb and Joshua. It was the children of those people, the children that had been born in the wilderness over those 40 years. They were the ones that were looking into the land that had been promised to their fathers, but was now promised to them. And it was Joshua they would cross the River Jordan with the people and, and go into this land flowing with milk and honey, this land that God had promised them. And the book of Joshua is exactly about that receiving the promise that God had given. 30 battles throughout the book of Joshua. And now at the very end, he gives his dedication. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. But before Joshua ever fought that first battle, he had to fight the battle on the inside. That's the first battle for all of us, that battle on the inside. And in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, it says, God's doing the talking here, and he's talking to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 6, that was, uh, that was verse 6. Verse 7, God says, only be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, but have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Verse 18, only be strong and courageous. Well, you kind of get the idea. God wants Joshua to be strong and courageous. Four times in the first 18 verses, he says, be strong and courageous. Well, my hunch is that he wanted Joshua to be strong and courageous because Joshua by nature, wasn't strong and courageous. You don't tell the person who's already strong and courageous to be strong and courageous. It's the person who's struggling. The person who most naturally is fearful. And I think that would be all of us who are most naturally fearful. The first emotion that any human ever mentions in, in the whole of the Bible, it's Adam. And God says, where, Adam, where are you? And he says, I hid for I was afraid. It's that emotion of fear that's most common to us all. It's that fear 
is the first battleground that we fight on, on the inside of us. It's that fear that we fight on the inside of us. Red Auerbach was the coach of the Boston Celtics. For those of you who aren't sports fans, that's a basketball team. And it was a lot of years ago, but he was scouting out basketball players from all the college players, and he found the one that he wanted for his first round draft pick. It was Billy Green, and Billy Green played for Colorado State. He was a great basketball player. And so he spent his first round draft pick on Billy Green. Billy Green came to, to training camp and wow, coach was, was really impressed with him. It wasn't until shortly before the season began that Billy Green unloaded a bombshell on the coach. He told him that he needed to figure out what his transportation arrangements would be, that he was too afraid to fly and he would need to take a train to all their games. Well, that was impossible. Their games were too far away for him to get there by train. And so the coach had to drop Billy Green, the number one draft pick, that it was fear that kept him from receiving all that he had been given. That's the way it was for God's people who left Egypt. And that's the way it is for us today. Not just those who have a fear of flying. It's fear. Fear that keeps us from receiving all that, that God has given us. The good news is that when Jesus was crucified on the cross, he took all those things that would destroy us. All those things that would conquer us. He took fear. He took shame. He took guilt. He took sin. All those things that would destroy us, he took on himself and he nailed to the cross to take away their power once and for all. And when Jesus rose from the grave, he gave that power, that power to you and me, the power of the risen Christ, the power of his Holy Spirit. Second Timothy 1.9, Paul is writing to a young man to let him know the power that is on the inside of him. A young man who is not up to the job that, that God has given him. So he's letting him know the strength, the power that's within him. And 2 Timothy 1.9 says, God did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. The power that God's given to you and me isn't power over others. It's power to fight that battle on the inside. Power and love. John tells, first John tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. It's not perfect love for ourselves. It's the perfect love that God has for, for you and for me. Power and love and self-control. That's the battleground. That's the battleground that... Jesus, when he rose from the grave, that he chose, chose to fight inside of you and me. Be strong and courageous. Joshua has been called to it and so have, have you and I. Fight the good fight. Fight the battle on the inside. But not only the fight the battle on the inside, to fight the battle on the outside. Joshua knew there really were giants in the promised land. That they really did have swords. They really did have shields and they really did have spears. There really was danger out there. Suffering is real. Heartache is real. Grief is real. And the spirit of the risen Christ the power of God is real. About 112 years ago, I served my first church. It was a little church down in LaGrange, Georgia. I was a senior in college and preached the first sermon I ever preached there in that little church. About 25 people were there. And the matriarch of the church, Annie Clyde Yates, was sitting on the front row. I finished that first sermon, and when I finished preaching, she said loud enough for everybody in there to hear, she said, wasn't that just the cutest sermon you ever heard? <laughs> well, everybody started laughing. And then she said, you know, 
after that was over with, I didn't know whether to spank him or burp him. You know, I, <laughs> the average age of that church was about, uh, about 75, 80 years old. You know, and I was about the youngest person they'd ever seen in their lives. <laughs> but they were wonderful, gracious, loving people. One of those people was my next door neighbor. His name was Obi Jeter. And Obi had a sunbeam milkshake maker. And he'd make milkshakes and he'd call me every once in a while and say, hey preacher, I'm making milkshakes. Come over and drink milkshakes with me. And I would go over to Obi's house and drink milkshakes and he'd start sharing stories. And I'll go ahead and tell you, Obi was about the best storyteller I've ever run across. He would tell stories. Hey, I guess Obi was probably about, I don't know, late 70s, maybe early 80s. And he would tell stories about when he was a kid. Obi was born in the early 1900s. And he was telling a story about when he was a kid in elementary school. He said the principal that whenever he saw anybody in school, he'd say, what's your Bible verse? That every, every child needed to have a Bible verse when uh, the, 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 they would tell the principal that they memorized. Well, Obi talked so fast and he, he knew the principal when he got nervous that he'd start stuttering and the principal wouldn't be able to understand what he said. So Obi told the other kids, my Bible verse is Jesus wept. That's the only one I can get out of my mouth. So that one's mine. You can't say that one. And so all the kids loved Obi so much that they honored that that was Obi's Bible verse, Jesus wept. And I got to thinking about that. That was, that was the verse that Obi carried through life with him. Jesus wept. Obi had lived through World War I. He'd raised a family through the Great Depression and World War II. Obi knew what suffering was like. He knew what sorrow. He knew what grief was like. And he knew that the one that heals our pain is the one that feels our pain. His name is Jesus. And Hebrews 2.18 says, and now... He can help those who are tempted because he himself suffered and was tempted. Jesus doesn't say, well, you know, there is no suffering. There is no pain. You know, it's all your imagination. It's just your point of view. No, Jesus said, place here your fingers in my hand. Place your hand in my side. That suffering is real. Heartache is real but I've been there first and it's nothing to be afraid of. Jesus gives strength we don't have. And I don't know the battles that you're fighting. They may be battles that maybe first started in the doctor's office. Or they may be battles maybe at workplace or at school or maybe in your home. I don't know the battles that you're fighting but I know that Jesus goes before. He goes behind us, he, go, he goes around us, beneath us, and inside of us. And the spirit of the risen Christ has, has power for you and for me. A power to, to fight those battles step by step, day by day, little by little. Receive power of the risen Christ to fight the battles on the inside. Dedicate your life to, to fight those battles with, with Jesus Christ, those battles on the inside, those battles on the outside. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is trust God for the results. Years ago, San Diego Chargers, which if you're not a sports fan, that's a football team. And they were struggling. So they had drafted a new quarterback. It was Dan Fouts. Dan Fouts would later become a, a Hall of Fame quarterback, but in those early years, he struggled with the rest of the team. One of those games, the team was two touchdowns behind and there were only two minutes left to play. The coach was exasperated. He pulled Dan Fouts out and put in the backup quarterback, Bobby Douglas. Bobby Douglas strapped on his helmet, started running toward the huddle out onto the field. He got about halfway there, turned around and came back. And Bobby Douglas said, Coach, you know, there are two minutes left. We're two touchdowns behind. Do you want me to tie it or do you want me to win it? <laughs> well, that's confidence, isn't it? That's confidence. Confidence in his own ability. 
But Jesus doesn't call us to have confidence in our ability. He calls us to have confidence in his abilities. And that word confidence, it's a Latin word. Con means with and fide means faith. That we have faith, we have trust in God's ability through you and through me, that it's, it's, it's not confidence in ourselves that we trust, it's confidence in him. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and me and he rose from the grave that he might live his life through us. And so often we think that, that this battle, that this life, that it's, it's, it's our last breath, a battle to our last breath, that it's, it's a battle, it's a battle to our last stand, that, that we did our best. But most often the battle is won not in our last stand, stand in our last breath. It's in our first breath every morning. That it's when we wake up and and our hopes and our fears, our aspirations come rushing at us And we fight that first battle to push them aside and to create a space, a holy place for the risen Christ that that he has space there first. Prayer has been called disciplined dedication to paying attention. And it's there in those, those first moments of every day that we begin to to practice turning to him. That we begin to practice that our lives really are dedicated to him and and that he's the one that's king of our hearts. It's in those first moments of every day that we create a holy space that, that we might recognize and give thanks to Jesus every step of every day. This morning, it may be that you've not invited Jesus into the the first moment of every day, that you've not dedicated your life in the first moments of every day. Yeah, you did it a long time ago for all of life, but not in the first moments of this day and every day, to meet him in prayer. A Christ, a Christ in, in your heart. And maybe that this morning that you did it a long, you, you dedicated your life a long time ago, but fear, fear has, has taken over that place in your heart. And that that's what you see every day. Well, I want to pray with you that the power of the risen Christ fight that battle on the inside. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, it's your day. And may we dedicate our lives to you starting this day, that in the first moments of every day, we set aside a time and a a place that we might dedicate our lives to you. that we receive what you've already given us, that your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit is is fighting that battle on the inside where we don't have the strength. Or maybe that battle on the outside started in the doctor's office or maybe it started at work or at school. Or maybe it's a battle that's there in the family. Lord, we dedicate our lives to you and your power, your love, 
your strength for self-discipline, that we might not have a spirit of timidity, but it's your power that, that gives us strength as we fight these battles. Lord, grant us grace enough to lean on you, trust you for the results, starting this day and in the days to come. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image, and what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to Him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.